As I noted, this is a post-crisis regulatory environment discussion, um, and I was using the analogy to kind of set up the discussion here. I'm sure at some point, either during your travels or during your youth, that you saw the Roadrunner cartoons where you had the very fast Roadrunner whizzing by and the wolf that was always trying to catch it and s sitting back with great frustration uh, in this pursuit that never happened. And it, it's, a, I think, a good analogy for what we saw in the financial markets and financial regulations around the world for the last 15, 20 years, where you had centers of what was perceived excellence in New York and, and London, uh, Frankfurt, or Hong Kong, or Tokyo. Uh, really setting this very rapid pace of uh, economic change, uh, financial regulatory change, with different zones around the world, like the Middle East, uh, attempting to keep pace. And we saw in the last two or three years uh, new al alliances that were set up, for example, the New York Stock Exchange with Qatar, Dubai setting up standards with uh, NASDAQ, all good things for cross-collaboration in, in the financial markets, but where was it leading us in terms of the, the uh, holy grail of uh, financial regulation? Uh, and now you could take that analogy as we were talking about before between the tortoise and the hare. The hare has been sprinting and what, ran into a wall, we were saying, and then the, the tortoise has just kind of marched right up and caught up, and now is wondering, you know, do I want to get into this great chase that's been pr happening for the last 20 years uh, or not? Does it really serve the purposes where I want to take my economy, and how does my economy fit into the regional economy, and then how does the region fit in uh, to the global context of, say, not just the G8 anymore, uh, but in a much more dynamic uh, standpoint, the, the G20? Uh, is the G20 the right vehicle? Can the G20 produce a real global architecture? We heard in October and November that it was, and then there was a big kind of two steps back to say, let's shore up things first, and then we can move forward perhaps with the architecture uh, thereafter. And I, I think that's actually an excellent place for us to, to start. And one of the things I wanted to say is that this discussion in particular was designed with the Global Redesign Initiative in mind. Uh, the GRI uh, that uh, Professor Schwab talked about yesterday and His uh, Highness, the Prime Minister of uh, Qatar, talked about uh, in support of this with Singapore and Switzerland, along with Qatar, is to look at uh, governing from the bottom up, but to make it a much more inclusive process, uh, where the voice is coming from. It's not from the top down, because that hasn't led us to the Holy Grail, but from the bottom up, and how has it become a much more global process with many more voices in that uh, in that uh, decision making. Uh, John, I'd, I'd like to start with you because I know you're involved in uh, the, the structure of the GRI and pr putting forth uh, papers in this area. Um, let's take, if we can, the top down. Uh, is the G20 architecture towards regulatory reform, towards what is a, a worn out phrase already, the new financial architecture, uh, what sort of influence will it have in the next six uh, months to a year, and then eventually we can take that uh, to the influence it's going to have on the region specifically. Do you want to start there? Sure. Um, well, I think there's the G20s, we've obviously been working on this issue, as have a number of other international bodies. So let me just highlight a few directions that I see emerging from uh, those uh, discussions that are likely to shape global regulation and uh, financial services. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, first, there's been a lot of focus on uh, capital and liquidity requirements and uh, changing those in light of the fact that the crisis uh, highlighted the excess uh, uh, leverage in the system as well as uh, the lack of uh, focus on liquidity and the insufficient liquidity uh, uh, that was there in the initial stages of the crisis. I think, therefore, you'll see, uh, as a general direction, uh, changes to capital requirements uh, such as trying to remove uh, arbitrages between the banking and trading books. Uh, you'll see changes uh, that uh, introduce measures beyond those that were in Basel I, Pillar I, but also start to put in either simple leverage tests or additional tests uh, as, with the, as with the stress testing that's uh, being uh, looked at now. Uh, and then you'll see uh, additional uh, changes in liquidity to focus more on that as a specific issue and topic with tools and benchmarks to measure that, that better than it's been measured in the past. So I think uh, uh, finally in that sort of general area of capital and liquidity, I think there'll also be a, a focus on fair value accounting and other things that might uh, uh, force changes in the way solvency is being measured. 
Uh, but beyond that kind of core area of capital and liquidity requirements, I think there's three other areas I just want to briefly touch on. Uh, one is the extension of the regulatory perimeter beyond banking. And I think another thing that was highlighted by the crisis was the number of unregulated uh, financial institutions that were out there and were uh, creating some of the systemic risk in the system. And so there's been discussion around extending uh, uh, the regulatory perimeter to non-bank financial institutions into the credit risk taking activities of insurance companies and even uh, some uh, uh, exploratory discussion around looking at the systemic risk caused by non-financial corporate. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, extending the perimeter is another general direction uh, that uh, uh, will be there. Um, third, uh, the topic of corporate governance standards. Uh, I think uh, a focus on a number of subtopics here, including organization structure and requirements for expertise, uh, incentives, and then uh, the reliance on models, both within financial institutions and also in the market as a whole and its reliance on rating agencies. Mm. And then finally, the systemic uh, risk uh, aspect of this, I, I think, has is another big topic now and specific to the G20 where uh, I think the view that's emerged is that much of the regulation was micro prudential if you will focused on uh, the individual firm and not as much on the macro economy and its developments and so uh, the G20 uh, has now um, been setting up within the financial uh, uh, services forum or now renamed the FSB uh, a um, framework for systemic risk monitoring in collaboration with the IMF and I think that will uh, uh, also uh, start to put in a different dimension to regulation that's been there in the past. Okay, good. Uh, Nasser, I think it would be good to get uh, uh, the DIFC's view on this because you're looking at a model that you've designed over the last, what, 10, 15 years to attract financial services companies into Dubai with a healthy competition with Qatar emerging, traditional competition from Bahrain. Uh, what does this mean then for individual country uh, regulation uh, and then perhaps GCC-wide cooperation, if I can put it in the larger context, and Sharif, I'll come to you afterwards, uh, on the broader Middle East regulatory uh, process going forward here. The idea is not to create regulation uh, for the, the sake of regulation, but to actually foster the right conditions for healthy competition. Well, I think that's a, that's a mouthful. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to limit uh, the comments just for, for uh, a minute or two, but you certainly can't divorce the nation-level regulatory uh, imperatives from what's happening on the global stage, as John, as, as John um, uh, briefed us. You have to make it relevant, but you also have to make sure that you're serving the development needs of your own industries, of your own, in, in particular, financial uh, industry. Um, for us in this part of the world, yes, we've, we've developed uh, uh, this platform as, for example, the DIFC or in Qatar as the uh, Qatar Financial Center to try to address this issue by leapfrogging the current standards in the region, trying to uh, lead by exception, uh, as it were, and create that uh, tension between what exists and what ought to be, uh, and try to move uh, the standards towards what ought to be, what needs to be. Uh, uh, to be, to be uh, uh, in place for the region to actually develop and become a part of the global economy. But there are some basics that st we still need to uh, cover uh, uh, or cover ground in, uh, right down to accounting standards uh, uh, that are not being applied uh, uh, as requirements on various institutions or corporates in the region. And take, for example, IFRS, the DIFC, for example, is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is the only jurisdiction in the region that actually imposes IFRS standard as a requirement for all registered entities under its jurisdiction. And that needs to be applied really across the board, um, whether it's IFRS mm -hmm. or whatever standard, uh, if for other institutions in the region. Uh, corporate governance, as uh, was mentioned earlier, is a big, big issue for the region. Um, the institutions, uh, corporates, both listed and non-listed uh, uh, corporates, have serious shortcomings when it comes to uh, the qualifications of board members, uh, the independence of uh, those boards, as well as their oversight capabilities <coughs> on those uh, 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 corporates. Uh, shareholder rights are not as protected as they need to be. Uh, transparency and disclosure is abysmal. Uh, you've seen a case, for example, in the Qatar and the Kuwait uh, stock exchange where 30 or so odd so um, equities were pulled off the market, basically a third of the market. Uh, we also have ex issues with executive compensation, but that's of late, uh, our learning from the, what's hap what we're seeing in the global um, uh, markets. But these issues serve as an impediment or uh, a handicap for the successful and sustainable integration of these corporates into the global mm. economy. 
Um, so that, those issues need to be addressed. There will be more regulation in the region, that's no doubt, because the, there are those basics in financial regulation that need to be established. You know, you mentioned the example of um, the tortoise and the hare. Um, you might think of us as a tortoise, but we weren't intending to be tortoises. Uh, we didn't want to be tortoises. It wasn't out of wisdom, mm. uh, necessarily. Um, uh, but having said that, we do need to learn from um, th what happened in the sense that uh, you need not always uh, embrace innovation if uh, innovation, um, uh, or let's say more specifically, um, complexity in, in new products uh, basically emasculates the role of governance, uh, mm -hmm. your capability of uh, actually tracking and understanding and risk managing from regulatory point of view uh, these, these products and, and this innovation. So these are our, our major issues that we need to deal with, but are also sometimes very basic issues, really, for, for, for the region. Uh, eventually, when you get into uh, governance structures and so on, um, if you want to try to not only build up the basics of the region, but also maybe address and preempt some of the developments happening on the, on the global stage, um, lo looking at macro prudential uh, management or liquidity risk management, um, ris uh, systemic risk, as, as John mentioned, uh, or early warning systems to put in place uh, into the regulatory structures, such as listening to your econ ec um, economists, for mm. example. Um, but also down to the corporate level, um, looking at um, traditional board structures or the traditional board model. Is it still relevant? I mean, is a board that meets once every quarter relevant to uh, adjusting to um, crises in the market? Or do you need something more dynamic as, as, as a model? These are questions that we can also address right now as, as, as this mm. region. Good. The other thing, before I move on to uh, Sharif, uh, the role of uh, English law at its core, I mean, was that a, a unique selling proposition for Dubai? And is this something that is going to remain the unique selling proposition vis-a-vis -vis competition around you in the region? Yes. It does, okay. I mean, 80, uh, we estimate about 80 or 85 percent of global business by uh, transaction value is conducted under um, uh, the governance of common law. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, probably Oliver Wyman has better statistics than we do on this. Uh, but that was an imperative. You need to have, uh, because common law uh, is considered more reliable and more predictable uh, by business. Okay. Uh, Sharif, you were in, you were in government uh, for many years in, in trade and industry and then in, in justice. Uh, when you see what we're going through now uh, as a result of the global uh, correction and then the competition that we have uh, emerging here, uh, is it wise to try to create a Middle East, pan-Middle East standard here for regulatory reform? Nasser has a competition here that he wants to sustain in Dubai. You have Qatar coming on quite strongly right now. What is the next stage model that we should be pointing to? A global standard? Uh, a GCC standard, a pan-regional standard? Uh, John, uh, I mean, these are very tough times for regulators uh, the world over, actually. Uh, regulators are trying to, to catch up or to play catch up uh, with the system, a financial system, a global financial system, which has grown uh, completely <laughs> unrecognizable to them in, in, in many parts of the world. Uh, John alluded to the uh, parallel financial system or the shadow financial system, which has grown in size uh, tremendously over the past 10 years. I mean, 2007, for example, uh, the numbers are available. The, uh, the balance sheets of the five then investment banks was about $5 trillion. The total assets of the banking system in the U.S. was 10 trillion. So it grew in size tremendously and the regulators really had to play catch up uh, to a system which, which became unrecognizable to them. Uh, this doesn't mean that uh, we have to, uh, I mean there, there is talk now about creating a super regulator, a worldwide super regulator, and I will leave others to talk about this, they are more uh, familiar with it. Uh, in the area, there is a sense of euphoria by regulators that this is a foreign problem. Our banks and our financial system and our institutions uh, have not been affected by it. Uh, to some extent, there is a sense of euphoria that uh, the, we, we, you know, our, our regulatory uh, bodies kept the lid on innovation. Uh, they kept the lid on uh, financial products, mm -hmm. and they are now uh, euphoric about it that they have saved the uh, financial systems around the world. This may be true, but we cannot lag behind in regulations. So I'm not saying we follow the global n new systems of regulatory regimes, but we have to watch them very carefully 
and some of them may be adaptable. We need to customize them uh, to our needs and uh, requirements. There is no, I mean, we heard today, I think, in this room by uh, Rashid Rashid, the Minister of Trade of Egypt, there is no one size fits all. Uh, not everything that is promulgated in New York or London fits us here in this area. Some of it may work. Uh, we cannot afford to be left behind, but again, not everything d does fit us in this area. If you want to talk about regional cooperation, and uh, again, good luck to you if you, if, if, if you want to establish regional standards. I'll give you one example. We signed the, the GAFTA, it was referred to in, in several of the sessions today, the Greater Arab Free Trade Area in 1952. <laughs> it, was, it was implemented in f f on 1st of January 2005. Yeah. The Treaty of Rome, I think, which establishes the European Union uh, dates to, to 1958. And look at the difference between where Europe uh, is and where the Arab. So to do some uh, things pan-Arab is very difficult. It's mm. extremely difficult. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. Regulators in the area, they do need to uh, communicate with one another more often, to talk to each other, to understand each other's problems, especially for financial institutions and insurance companies that are active globally in the in the region, in the area, and we do have a number of them. Uh, to date, they have sufficed with memorandum of understandings and sharing of information, etc. I think this system has to change. We need to have a more advanced system to monitor pan-Arab, let's call them, financial institutions and insurance companies. Okay. Uh, Professor Qureshi, I'd like to get your thoughts on this and the, if I can use the, the terminology, the role of Big Brother. I mean, does the state come in quite aggressively right now to say, uh, well, we backed off the last five to ten years for the purposes of innovation and to allow the financial architecture to be built and to keep capital closer to home. We do need to play a much bigger role. The state needs to step in uh, to, uh, to regulate in a much heavier way than we wanted to five years ago. Is there a danger of that? There is an acute danger, but what we have to bear in mind is that the clamor for regulation will never solve the fundamental problem, which is that those who are motivated by greed will always find a way around. They will always be able to find gullible individuals or people who don't have sufficient expertise of the market to be able to manipulate the market. This uh, question has been addressed uh, so far as the UK, US is concerned. Now everyone points to the US as being uh, heavily regulated and much more so after the collapse of Enron and WorldCom, we had the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, legislation and in the UK, we took the view that this was to our advantage because the UK prides itself on being a, a light touch regulatory system mm. based more on principles than rules. Now, fundamentally, was there any real distinction? The only problem, uh, so far as this distinction is concerned, is that ultimately both systems of regulation failed, spectacularly, both in the US and the, the UK. The reasons for the failure are uh, numerous. A lack of uh, cooperation between the different regulators. For example, in the UK, we had the collapse of a bank, uh, Northern Rock. We had three potential regulators, the Financial Services Authority, the Treasury, and the Bank of England. None of them were able to share information with each other, and this is despite the fact that a new system had been brought into effect after the, uh, the crisis that we'd had almost 20 years ago, the recession in the 1990s. So it didn't work. The regulators weren't able to uh, spot the problems and deal with them effectively. There was greater emphasis on formalism, less on substance. Yeah. What's going to happen in the region? In Qatar, uh, wisely, the Qatar authorities have shelled for now the idea of creating a unified regula le regulator. I say wisely because uh, the tortoise hair analogy is perhaps apt. Perhaps what was happening in jurisdictions like the UK was that they were racing ahead mm. and the feet have only just touched the ground. No particular jurisdiction has the right answers or all the answers. And what one would hope for is that in jurisdictions like Qatar, they will take stock and move forwards cautiously and in a conservative manner. So Big Brother is certainly there, and the state needs very little excuse to step in. Whether that will be to the benefit of the market uh, is unlikely, hmm. because ultimately it comes down to internal culture in any society or any corporate environment. At the, at the core of this, though, I think, it, and this is the, the issue in the United States as well, there's a lack of understanding of the products that were derived. Absolutely. Uh, so it's very hard to regulate something if uh, you're a banking regulator and then uh, a number of derivative products have been designed uh, basically to make money but not designed to deliver long-term value 
uh, to whether it's a pension fund or a, a, a personal investor. Is, Simon, do you see that as a huge issue going forward in a sense that you don't want to stop innovation uh, and new product development, but how do you regulate something that you really don't have an understanding? Even the people who created it, I don't think, know the long-term implications of some of the products. <coughs> well, I thought I was going to have a view, <coughs> excuse me, which is uh, provocative and contrary to your, but I'm glad to hear that, that I haven't. I mean, the, the, I mean, historically, I mean, I think we have to focus in on, on uh, the fact that the, the region is made up of a number of different sub-areas. Um, there's the GCC as, as one unit to date. My understanding is the only uh, cross-border reg regulation is really in the GCC, and that's the economic agreement back in sort of 2002, which was a platform for the mutual recognition of, of, of ownership rights in the GCC and the customs union. Mm -hmm. There are a number of bilateral MOUs between governance and the financial services sector and elsewhere, but they, they aren't really as a matter of, of law. So we're starting from a point where there is, 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 is very, very little uh, regulation. Um, that, combined with the fact there's no supranational regulator at all, um, leads me to the belief that I don't think there is a need rather than desirability for any regulation in, in um, uh, cross-border regulation in the region at the moment. I say that with two possible exceptions, which I'll come to, come to in a minute. And the reason why I think that, that that's important is it's, it's not just because it's on the too difficult to deal with pile. I, th I think it's, um, it's a combination of the legal systems in the region are still relatively infant. There's a lot of history in the countries, but the, the legal systems are infant. Um, um, I forget, it was Sharif mentioned about uh, the Treaty of Rome, 1948. If you think it's more than 50 years the EU has, has, has been with, with the Treaty of Rome in place, and look where it, it has or hasn't got to. It, it, only, it has cross-border regulation in the financial services space and in a number of other areas, but no supranational um, regulator with the exception of, of antitrust, right? And that's in over 50 years. Um, so the, 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 the legal systems are still infant. They need a time to, uh, some time to, to grow and develop before they can be exported by um, governments uh, to assist a cross-border approach. Um, I think it's the wrong stage in the, the economic and political development cycle for the Middle East in the whole psyche for, for uh, cross-border regulation. And um, my preference is, and this might be prov provocative from what I was hearing in the room earlier, is that the... Um, I would like there to be competitiveness amongst Middle Eastern economies in the regulatory space at the moment, because I think it's the, the, the preferential way to raise the bar from a regulatory perspective and from a corporate governance perspective. Now, I don't think that should happen for, forever. I think it's just for the time being, because I don't think there's going to be the cohesion as a region uh, to, to raise it to the same level. The, the, I mentioned I thought there might be two areas where, where we could go um, with, with uh, cross-border regulation now. One's in the financial services space. Many, many of uh, our clients are um, uh, looking strongly to having some form of GCC passport for um, uh, marketing and selling uh, 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 financial products or, or services. The ability effectively to get licensed in one jurisdiction and to be able to sell those products in another. Yeah. Now that would be done in a, um, a bilateral or multilateral treaty framework, um, but you'd have to underpin it with um, a, a number of principles which were recognized, a bit like the European approach with MIFID. Are these markets mature enough for that, Simon, or not? Are we there yet in terms of well, the ability to, to move there in the next 12 to 24 months? I, I think uh, you are, depending on, it's the underlying principles that are important. I think you need to have developed the principles similar to, to MIFID where, and the regulators are comfortable sitting with that, that lower space denominator. But the other area which I think is, is absolutely critical is foreign direct investment. There's no way that there's going to be any movement forward in the, the corporate regulation space until you solve foreign direct investment. At the moment, the approach in the region is either a 5149 rule on the one hand, mm. or you have a, a, a negative list approach, or there are some other spurious approaches. You, um, I don't think international investors are going to look at the region as a region rather than individual um, uh, jurisdictions until you effectively have a, have a common approach. And I think that's, re you, and that's, that's almost mandating um, the development of, of um, regional players rather than just national players, which we've heard a couple of times. Um, Could you get to the area, if I can pinpoint yeah. this down, uh, where somebody wants to take an investment in Saudi Arabia and says, I want to be governed by Qatar, I'd like to be governed by Dubai. Is that a kind of a dream or a possibility? That's what are your different. Thoughts? No, I think that's different. That, yeah. That's a regulator issue. 
I'm just talking about cross-border regulation. Uh, uh, the regulator space, I think, is far more difficult. Because I mean, if you look at the, the EU, um, there's only one supranational regulator, which is the, the antitrust. But there's plenty of cross-border regulation. And what it does is it left the, the, the enforcement competence um, at national level. And OK, there's a difference in, in how the, the national authorities are, are regulated. But, but that's very, very different, I think, from having, a, having a, a, um, for example, a, a Qatari regulator effectively looking after uh, um, cross-border uh, investments into Saudi. Good. No, sir. Okay. If I can take that point, I mean, uh, the, the difference um, is, 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 is a, maybe a, a, a slight one, but a, but a very important one. Uh, and that is that you can have uh, regulatory cooperation or jurisdictional cooperation based on a framework of um, uh, understanding uh, in terms of cross-recognition of products, in terms of uh, even the holy grail, the cross-recognition of, of, of institutions. But uh, you can leave the enforcement or the execution down to the national level. Uh, so you have uh, relative independence on the national level of regulators, but they agree that these are the set of principles we're working on. This is the framework we're working on, uh, and so we can move forward from there. I would disagree that that we need more regulatory competition. I think that it's a it's a short term uh, issue, and even with um, organizations like uh, the DIFC or Qatar, we would view as um, uh, you know oriented around the short term stimulation of change. But the long term goal is to have an integrated. Uh, uh, a regulatory environment, uh, or let's say aligned regulatory environment, uh, at least uh, in the GCC, to take advantage of the raw potential available in this part of the world, both from a demographics point of view, from the commodities and assets story, uh, uh, and from from the potential of uh, a greater participation in global economy. I mean, we are, by our estimates, uh, the take for example the currency union, uh, if properly properly executed, and you have alignment in terms of and and, and greater economic cooperation, this block can become the world's fifth largest economy. Uh, but we need to build institutions to make that, to make that happen. And that only comes with regulation. The, uh, the currency union or the uh, uh, monetary union is a, a great fundamental step forward in that uh, direction. And we want to see other things happen. We want uh, the uh, uh, bilateral MOUs or even multilateral MOUs for product recognition across the GCC to make the passport, passportability issue uh, happen. Uh, we want uh, to see uh, the exchange of uh, resources and expertise in the GCC, um, and we want to create that, that, that platform to, to encourage or enable the institutions from this part of the world to become effective players on the global, uh, global stage. Uh, I remember, um, I'll come back to you, Simon, in just a second. Uh, 1998, I think it was, I was visiting Athens and went to the stock exchange just to see, everybody was talking about this new culture that had taken hold. Uh, and everybody wanting to participate. The good side of it, it was broadening investment all the way down to every class of person. The smallest investor was participating, but there was such a fervor that they were they were using uh, binoculars to look through the door of the stock exchange, and it was almost like trading uh, or betting on horses. And having you know been in the region uh, now quite frequently for the last three or four years, um, there was the same culture taking hold in the in the financial markets. Uh, wildly wild swings in stocks, a lot of insider yeah. trading, a lot of uh, uh, speculation on a daily basis, and therefore, when the markets did uh, crack, it wasn't falls of 25, 30 percent, but we were looking at you know 65, 75, 80 percent uh, corrections. How do we address, uh, in a simple term, and John, you can take it from the outside, and then we can uh, focus it on the inside too. Uh, the, the casino culture that immediately takes hold when you start to open up financial markets and try to broaden out the investor base. Is it something that you, could, you can tackle or you, should you not try to regulate this sort of mentality? Well, I think it's, it's hard to uh, regulate uh, behavior in that particular sense. But I think, coming back to one of the directions I highlighted earlier, I think when you see behaviors accumulating into a very significant economic issue, as, as has happened over the last few years. This is where potentially uh, more uh, monitoring at the macro level, the sort of systemic risk uh, monitoring idea could come into play and you could look at if you believe that uh, there's been a significant, uh, there's significant asset bubbles building mm. in one way or another, uh, then what, what types of actions can be taken to try to maybe not directly go after the bubble, but to try to limit its potential spillover impact into the rest of the economy. So I think that's potentially the role for uh, where this G20 body on uh, trying to have some kind of COVID systemic risk discussion uh, could go. But I think it's hard to regulate individual behavior. How about insider trading? Anybody? 
seems like it was fairly rampant in terms of uh, some of the stock run-ups before deals have been announced here. How do we step into that, uh, Professor? Well, insider, I, I saw an example of insider trading myself sitting in the takeover panel in England in January where I was involved in a large multi-billion pound takeover. Uh, it's a, a course of activity that, that is still engaged in in the UK, US. It's a question of detection. What we need to have in the uh, GCC region in the Middle East more broadly is greater awareness of what uh, responsible uh, investing is about. Uh, the incentive to make a, a, a quick profit is the incentive that has led to the present situation, both in terms of corporate culture, the absence of taking a long-term view, rewards based upon a quick accumulation of perceived gains, and that then spills into the, uh, the culture so far as investors are concerned. So if we are talking about developing uh, institutions and uh, structures which will enable not just foreign direct investment, but uh, greater investment on the part of people, there ought to be some attempt made to provide them with education that in addition to uh, gains, there are risks. The risk side is not something that we tend to focus on. <coughs> uh, the fitness of firms in the region to prepare for this regulatory regime that may be kind of coming into the uh, environment uh, in the future, are the firms fit? Are they positioning their staffs? Are they starting to collaborate with accounting firms to get the right conditions in place to uh, help work with companies in the region to uh, enter a new regulatory environment. Simon? You say fitness, what type of firm? Well, the, the hiring of the right talent, the training that you have in legal firms, the training yeah. you have in accounting firms. I mean, you can't, I mean, Nasser could sit there and say, I'd like to design this, but if you don't have the, the intellectual prowess as a firm uh, to meet the needs of the company, it's, it's kind of a useless exercise. You can design something on paper, but can you actually put it into action? I mean, from a regulatory perspective, I think <clears throat> all of the, the uh, provisions are in place. I mean, if you go to Saudi, uh, you uh, go to the, the, the DFM, the ADX, the UE, leaving aside the DIFC, which I think is slightly different, which I'll come back to in a minute, I think is a, is a special animal. Um, actually, I think it's quite impressive what regulations have been put in place over the last uh, two, three years. So that's not the issue. They've imported the gold standard uh, largely from the UK and, um, and it's in a recognisable form. The issue is compliance. Uh, it's compliance, 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 because I think the regulatory frameworks are there um, and, and to a lesser extent enforcement. And inevitably, with compliance and enforcement, they come to the same thing, which is um, the, the, the uh, experience base of the people who are there for, on the internal compliance side and on the enforcement side. And it's not, a, it's not meant to be a criticism, it's more an observation, is that the, the regulatory standard in, 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 in the, the region needs to improve. Mm. That's across, across the board. And that's not because the people in those positions aren't intelligent, it's because they just don't, haven't had, they lack the experience. Um, that's one, one of the reasons why, for example, in Saudi, my, my observations in Saudi, actually, the experience base is much, much higher than the rest of the region. Why? Because of the volume on the exchange, purely in that. Mm. So they, they've got the experience through the volume on the exchange. They know they have much, much more to lose um, because of the size size of the market if it goes wrong. Um, so, so it comes back to the the whole education theme, which has been permeated throughout the last 48 hours, and it, it extends to the regulation side as well. That you just have to train people um, up. Just, just turning to the DIFC. I mean, Nass will probably hate me for saying this, but but the DIFC is a special case. I mean, the the, the, the I don't hate you for that. The, 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 you know, he hasn't what, finished yet. What, <laughs> what's what's been what's been uh, you know, developed in the DIFC is, I think, quite remarkable in the region, particularly in the time available. Um, and the, but it is very different from, let's say, if you took on a legal system basis, you have Saudi on the one end, which has. Um, Sharia law permeating through the entire law. It's not just an overlay. You then come to something like um, Bahrain and, and the UAE where um, there are commercial laws with a Sharia overlay to Kuwait, which effectively in its laws <coughs> actually uh, specifically states that Sharia doesn't apply to the, to, to the civil law. And then you go to the, the, the um, what, what are, some people describe, this is the bit you won't like, as the offshore centers of the DIFC and the QFC. Mm. Right. If you go to speak to regulators in Saudi, they see the DIFC as a, a little piece of England. 
they say you've got basically English laws there, English court rules, and English judges. Right? And that's why the, one of the big problems with the, with the DIC is, is that um, there's a lot of huge transparency, fantastic levels of corporate governance. But if you went and got in a judgment in the DIFC courts, how do you actually seek to enforce that elsewhere in the region? And it is still a very big open case, because if it all worked perfectly, you'd be able to troop down to the Dubai courts to get your, your, your endorsement. Um, and then effectively, under the Riyadh Convention, be able to go to any of the uh, countries that have signed up to the Riyadh Convention, which I think is 14 or 15 countries in the, in the Middle East, to automatically enforce your judgment. It's never been tested. So there's this sense of the offshore government. So I think we have to treat the DIFC and the QIFC as slightly different to, to what I would call the onshore jurisdictions. Craig, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, look, you know, when it comes to um, the, the DIC, as I mentioned, it, um, it, it's considered a, 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 a way of stimulating change for the region uh, in a way that Dubai has has done for, for 20 or 30 years in its history through various industries. And the DIC is another uh, evolve, uh, evolution of that, of that uh, methodology or that uh, tendency for Dubai to lead by, by exception. So when it comes to the legal framework, it was necessary to be common law in order to encourage or develop um, the, the, this, uh, this cluster. And Clifford Chance is part of the cluster, uh, in large part because of uh, the, the infrastructure we've installed in sure. the DIFC. So it's been effective from that perspective in terms of um, headquartering, headquartering uh, these institutions in the region, some of them for the first time in their history. When it comes to enforceability of, for example, um, the laws of the DIFC, um, the courts and the laws of the DIFC are considered uh, Dubai courts. So a ruling by a DIFC court, whether it be by the Chief Justice, uh, who is British, or the Deputy Chief Justice, who is uh, Singaporean, or the uh, 10 other justices from different parts of the world, um, is swiftly enforced by uh, uh, Dubai authorities, which means any entity that or jurisdiction that recognizes Dubai as a jurisdiction should recognize a uh, DIFC ruling because it's considered Dubai period, uh, not a DIFC ruling. And that's been tested in uh, jurisdictions such as Malaysia and Czechoslovakia and Canada, where you have execution orders yes. in those jurisdictions based on a court order from the DIFC. So it's good enough for them, it's good enough for, um, for other jurisdictions. So there's no question in my mind in terms of the enforceability of contracts in, in, in the DIFC. That's been proven. Um, but having said that, um, we still want um, uh, alignment or work towards coordinating the legal systems of or the rules within those different uh, countries in, in the region. Uh, we don't start from the premise that they're different, therefore they will continue be, to be different. They're different, therefore we need to align them. Right? So we do need to work towards or in that direction. But we need to step away from the philosophy or philosophical uh, agreements that we may have as a greater Arab region or a greater yep. Islamic region and all of that um, um, uh, uh, fluff, in, in, in my view, with all due respect. For me, it comes, uh, real uh, progress comes with tangible issues that are solved with cooperation, uh, whether it be a cross-recognition recognition of a specific enforcement matter related to contracts between uh, Dubai and uh, Riyadh, uh, or, and so on. And we do have examples of where we did this, for example, with the, uh, a bilateral MOU that we have with Malaysia uh, for the cross-recognition of Islamic products or uh, Sharia-compliant products between the two jurisdictions. So there's automatic passportability and that kind of thing. These are the models we need to pursue because there's a fundamental opportunity right now. We all talk about the East-East phenomena or the South-South phenomena. You know? mm. There was an OECD that talked about 50% of global trade is now South-South. The situation is unprecedented in modern history. Yeah. Nobody would have imagined, tw imagined it 20 or 30 years ago. Just like nobody would have imagined that the global financial institutions would collapse and you'd have Chinese institutions, in the uh, four or five of them, in the top 10 financial institutions in the world. Uh, nobody would have imagined that you have states like Qatar being a um, net creditor to the U.S. Um, you know, you, you're in a scenario now where the world is fundamentally changing. And the idea is that how can we support these institutions from, or the companies rather, uh, 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 from these regions, uh, make sure that this is a sustainable trend. Because right? there are a lot of institutional frameworks that are not built in the East-East um, uh, uh, relationship or in the South-South relationship that you might take for granted in the North-North relationship, such as the Bretton Woods institutions, or the IMFs and the IIFs and the OECDs of the world. So it's not about, you know, should we follow the G8? It's about, is the G8 relevant to what's happening in the global economy? Because uh, there's a whole new G X Y Z coming up uh, mm -hmm. that will define commerce globally. So where are the institutions that will follow this trend? 
and are they sustainable? And you know, what are those institutions? That's a great point uh, that can emerge in the region to uh, cooperate with the FSB, as uh, as John was talking about it. Would you get your thoughts, and then we'll take it around the room here. Well, I, the question is not rhetorical. I'm I'm actually asking the, I'm actually asking the question mm. because we don't really. I, I but can't find is them. it going to be the GCC Central Bank that emerges fast enough to be able to to get us there, or is it going to be just national entities? It, I mean, it it could be the central banks of each uh, jurisdiction, and then you have the Arab Monetary Fund, as well, which should be our uh, uh, focal group, le really, for these discussions. Okay. Nasser shaking his head as it was gonna, it's yeah. the initial reaction <laughs> I had. It's not ready for that job yet, is it? Not? We, we need to. We, we don't need the legacy institutions. I like the the, the saying that says that um, uh, the problem can't be solved with the same mentality that brought that brought it about. Um, so when I hear that you know the IMF has been given the mandate to uh, look into um, a macro prudential um, mechanisms as early warning signals for the next crisis, you know I have to roll my eyes um, because you need uh, a new type of thinking to deal with this uh, this issue uh, and trying to reinvent legacy institutions that were originally mandated with uh, an objective that is irrelevant in today's world is not going to do it. Hmm. I think we can inject the new thinking that uh, my colleague is talking about into the existing institutions. You can. Creating new ones may not be the right I idea at this stage. But can I just go back to, to something Mr. Qureshi mentioned? Uh, greed. How, how do you, I mean, uh, a part of the crisis was caused by greed, actually. It wasn't the lack of regulations, or lack of regulatory or supervi uh, supervisory bodies, but by ethical standards. And how do you regulate that? It's, it's, it's a very tough issue. Hmm. It's a very tough problem. And again, we go back to the behavioral issues which, uh, which John was talking about. I was taking it's, some it's notes. It's difficult to, to regulate these issues. No, no, in fact, if I can pick up on that thought, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, Sharia products. I mean, you want to be able to innovate these products. So you don't want to put them back in the bottle and go down to the lowest common denominator. So you had some good competition with you know, Malaysia emerging, the UK trying to challenge Dubai developing products, the same thing with Qatar. I mean, you don't want to, to over-regulate something that's just coming out and just being accepted around the world. You're, you're smiling now, sir. Professor uh, Qureshi, do you want to jump in on this as well? But I, I agree with you that uh, so far as the Middle East or GCC region is concerned, the present situation presents it with enormous potential. And if the example of the Treaty of Rome is perhaps apt. Treaty of Rome was entered into in 1957. The UK didn't actually sign up to it until 1972, mm. in the aftermath of a deep recession, when self-interest drove the UK to sign up to it, which is the motivating f factor for so many Eastern European states to want to join the European Union. Yeah. And that's the ultimate point. When it's in their self-interest, they will join. But somebody has to uh, take the initiative and develop the momentum. Islamic finance is, uh, uh, is an interesting area because, of course, it's being promoted as the panacea, w which can provide us with an antidote to greed, yet those of us who are outsiders, I don't proclaim to be an Islamic finance expert, look at this issue somewhat quizzically. It's surrounded by mysticism. In fact, there are quite a lot of people who would go a little bit further than that and make some disparaging remarks about it. The next problem if we're looking at the horizon, is likely to be with reference to Islamic finance. Because insofar as it's regulated, it's not really regulated. There's an exercise of rubber stamping that takes place. Mm. There are quite a lot of lucrative deals that are being entered into. But it, I wait to see when uh, the ingenuity of my profession uh, cracks open the very many financial instruments that have been entered into. And the time is about right now. Can I, can I just amplify that point, because I agree with you 100%, um, and I, it's not a panacea, um, and there are a lot of fundamental issues that need to be answered in this industry, such as what is this, this kind of regulation that you have for this industry, and is it regulation or not? Um, you know, there is a lot of innovation happening in the industry, still new, but there's a lot of innovation happening, whereas before is considered Islamic banking periods was considered impossible, now it's made possible mm. with certain innovations. And whereas previously we said that hedging is impossible because you're not allowed to short, you're not allowed to sell what you don't have under Sharia uh, principles, which is a very basic part of the Sharia principles. Now you do have platforms that have been launched through Sharia Capital and Barclays, for example, hedge fund platforms that are Sharia compliant. So it's only a matter of time. 
before the complexity of uh, sh Sharia compliant products catches up to the conventional products. So I'd be very careful in dealing with this as, 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 as your, your, your um, dual uh, pill that will solve these, these issues. Uh, now, there are certain principles nonetheless that, that, are, that are useful, such as, such as the avoidance of uh, ambiguity in, in financial dealings, which is a fundamental um, and, and, and frankly a lesson uh, uh, that we can all take on board. Um, so, you know, I, I agree you have to be careful, but at the same time, let's still look at it as an opportunity to learn and maybe a new uh, alternative way of, of, of doing things that this region in particular, uh, talking about the subject of, 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 of the session, can take advantage of when they um, uh, leverage on the regulations and, inf and legal infrastructure of the region to go uh, global. I was just going to build on uh, one of Nasser's points and, uh, and agree with it in that um, I think that the lack of transparency in some of the innovation, innovative products that developed was a key part of the problem. That it, it wasn't, uh, there was a lot of criticism of the uh, securitization model, the sort of originate to distribute model that emerged in the wake of the crisis. But I think the originate to distribute model has been around for a long time uh, in the form of, um, say, conventional uh, residential mortgage securities uh, going back to the 60s and 70s, corporate bonds uh, going back even further, and didn't cause the same uh, problems. Uh, but those were very transparent risks. I think it was very clear, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, the risk was being measured and was being transferred and you could see where it was on the investor's balance sheet. I think what happened in, with some of the recent innovation, if you call that original uh, originate to distribute was an innovation, I think was a positive innovation. But then you had innovation that went in the form of making things more opaque, more complex, lack of transparency, couldn't be regulated, and uh, or was moving away from a, a, a state where it could be regulated. And that was a problem. So I don't think innovation itself uh, should be uh, squashed, if you will, but it's mm -hmm. sort of, there are uh, certainly certain types of innovation that emerged that were dysfunctional for the system. I, I brought this along today to, to, ref, to ref, uh, reference perhaps where we're going to be going uh, in the future. It was the London summit of the G20, uh, the communique statement of April 2nd, and I highlighted a few things. And the, the very general terms, and that's what kind of worries me, because you don't know what's going to come out of it as a result. Uh, point 13, strengthening financial supervision and regulation. Um, we will take action to build a stronger, more globally consistent supervisory and regulatory framework for the future of the financial sector. Well, you Go think they have? <laughs> Please, if we can get a microphone, too. You never got an answer to your very first question. Um, I mean, there was a fundamental shift after the London summit um, in that the G8 world did collapse. Um, you know, look at the composition of the Basel Committee. It was comprised of North Americans, 13 European central banks, and Japan. That has changed. You know, the Indians, the Chinese, the Hong Kong, Singapore, all, and, and, and others have all been invited to join the Basel Committee. The composition of the Financial Services Forum, which again was essentially G8, has been fundamentally shifted. Uh, and the major emerging markets uh, have been invited and have now joined. So the days when somebody said it, you know, the days when the G8 called all the shots have gone. Hmm. What worries me is not the uh, ability of the rest of Asia to respond to this uh, new architecture, because it is a new architecture. You know, international regulation post March 2009 is going to be completely different than before. Well, the reason the ability I, yeah. of this region to respond, and I haven't heard the, the answer yet to the question, this region is represented on the G20 by historical reasons, by Saudi Arabia. And Turkey. Mm? And, and Turkey. Turkey. Sorry, forgive me, yes. Um, and whereas I can see the Indians and the Chinese in their corner, I'm, you know, how adequately is that representation in this region going to ensure that the drive for international standards, and they're going to be international standards. I mean, we've seen it in accounting standards, we've seen it in you know, Basel II will have to be rewritten, it'll have to be implemented, and it'll have to be done on the basis of international um, cooperation. Um, I'm worried about 
the involvement in this region in that process. And while I've got the mic, sorry. Can I, can um, I, can yeah. I just go back to the danger? Do you want, why don't you stop for just a second? Yeah, okay. keep, the, keep the microphone and we'll come back to you. Go ahead. I mean, it, it's, it's a fair comment. Uh, and uh, we, we, we'll always be followers in this area, and with all due respect. And please do not expect us. We've had our banking system in some countries and our regulatory system uh, 10 years old or 20 years old uh, to, to, to become the innovators of the global financial, of the redesign of the global financial system. Give us a break here. Uh, so, but we, we should participate. I think we need better coordination by, uh, by the region with our two representatives, Saudi Arabia and Turkey. I mean, to my mind, Turkey before going, uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, before going to the G20, no coordination took place at all on, on many levels, let alone the financial, the new financial regulatory system with the rest of the region. So maybe we need to get our act together here so, uh, so that our two representatives carry our concerns. But don't expect us to lead or to be the innovators of this. Did you want to pick it up on take time. I, I, if, if I can I, just get another I microphone may, to, to the gentleman. I'd like to make a point on Islamic banking. At, uh, All right. Good. Good. The microphone here, but carry on. All right. I, I, just a word of warning about these analogies with uh, Europe. Um, it's not the case that there's only one pan-European regulatory agency. There are dozens, actually, whether you deal with patents or trademarks yeah. or re registration of uh, drugs. Um, there's a lot of experience of pan-European registration. There's also now a lot of experience, particularly in financial services, of pan-European single regulation. It may be implemented at national level, but I can tell you, if you're a bank, the, the, the new capital requirements directive has direct force on the way you operate. But I, I, I can't let go unchallenged this reference to passporting. It's not a panacea, and we saw that to the fury of uh, the FSA and the Bank of England in the UK when the Icelandic banks, who had been it's taking point, deposits in the UK at a ferocious rate through a um, passporting arrangement, mm. uh, collapsed, leaving uh, enormous numbers of people unprotected. And if you think the regulators of the rest of the world didn't notice that mm. and will not take action to prevent that sort of uh, arbitrage of regulation, um, got another thing coming. So passporting is not necessarily uh, the answer. Can I speak? Yeah. Yeah, pick it up and then when yeah, I come back to the Totally general. agree with that and that's, that's why I emphasize it's certain financial products and services. I think if you go to the extent of the passporting regime in the EU, I agree with you, it, it didn't work and it's shown not to work and there's a reversal away from, from that. And that's why I think it, it, it would be restricted, to the, the passporting to effectively enable the, the, the regional financial services market to move to the next level, but I agree with you, it's not the fantasy. Yeah, it was amazing, like, uh, the, having lived in London, you wake up one day and all of a sudden it's like your local council had you know, anywhere from six to 15 million pounds in Icelandic banks to try to take a leverage or arbitrage off the other two or three percent. We had an interjection from the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Khaled, I'm from Qatar. Uh, now, regarding uh, the financial crisis that we had and how to reform our financial crisis. Now, I, I do disagree that uh, uh, my colleague here said we cannot be a leader, we need to be a follower. You know, this is completely wrong. And it's not because of our capability of our, or our capacity, but just because of the nature of our economy. Uh, now, uh, at some part of the last 10 years, uh, some of the GCC states, I'm talking particularly about GCC, not about the, the other Arab countries, they try to be part of the global economy. So what they did, they adopt a Western England system in terms of the regulations and in terms of the, the policy they did in the financial market. Uh, now, the issue they forget that we do not have the same nature. Our economy is different. We, we don't need to have a double digit growth rate in our economy. See, we do not have poverty issue, we do not have uh, unemployment issue, so why have double growth rate? I mean, to have this double growth rate in the economy, this means financial institutions have to take more risk. You know, we have to adopt a system with a financial system, and at the same time, we provided some products that has more flexibility, you know, so we can attract investors in it. 
So these things caused a problem for us. It was very easy for us to avoid these things. Okay, so I think uh, uh, one of the problems we did again, we adopted a Western system. And what scared me that we did not learn from our mistake. Uh, up to now, I do not see any initiative to reform the financial regulations in the GCC. Everybody is waiting for the West to put a new system and then we will try to adopt it. And that means that we did not learn from our mistake, unfortunately. This is very, very issue, a critical issue. Okay. In fact, stop it there, keep the microphone, but uh, let's get some comment on it because are we making the same mistake in the region you know, yet again that it'll be adopted in the West and we'll adapt it, uh, adoption in the West and adapt it here? Uh, professor? I agree with you that there's no reason why the region should always be following. Uh, when we're looking at financial regulation, obviously the markets that have customarily been the ones responsible for developing financial regulation have been able to do so because they were hubs for capital. The, we know where the capital is now, and we, were, we know where the capital will be for the foreseeable future. So there's no reason why once know-how has been developed and confidence has been acquired, that the innovation can't take place in the region. Uh, so far as uh, the interim period, there seems to be no choice but to look at what's happening in the established markets and to see whether or not, in principle, it can be used, if it is fit for purpose, and then try and adapt it. And I emphasize in the interim, because perhaps 10, 15 years from now, or hopefully a shorter period, the region will be innovating in the way that you aspire it to be. Another point you had? Yeah, I mean, uh, just to continue, I mean, uh, I mean, we were part of the establishment of the QFC. One of the reasons we created the QFC is not to, to be honest, the main reason wasn't to attract more capital, no. To build know-how, to attract the systematic knowledge to our institutions. I think now we were, a we were able to attract this knowledge. So it is time to, uh, to bring, uh, I mean, to, to redraft or to develop new regulations by our own <coughs> instead of adopting, you know, something that suits our, our system and our, our economic issue. Uh, the second point probably is different, I don't want to switch it, about corporate governance that was mentioned briefly. Okay, hold on to it for a second because I want to come back to corporate governance. Okay. Simon had a comment on your previous a, thought and then we'll come to John. Just a, a, a comment on the first one. Um, I think there's, there's no harm for the region to, to wait, I don't think it has to go on the front foot. Um, and the reason I say that is I think there's a, there's a real danger uh, in, the, in Europe and the, the rest of the developed economies, there's such a political pressure for regulation to go too far. And if it goes too far, I think there's, there's a, a real potential for the region to actually attract capital and, and, and human capital to the region if it responds with what I would call proportionate regulation. Already, I've seen, um, and NASA will be delighted with this, um, we've had more than 20 inquiries uh, in the last three, four weeks from regulated entities in London looking at the opportunity at relocating to the DIFC. Why? Because they believe that the, the London market is going to be overregulated. Now that's in the hedge fund private equity space, so there's not surprises there. So my feeling is actually, whilst I think it's important to be at the table, and for Saudi Arabia in particular, to be the mouth of the region in, at the G20, I think there's actually no harm in holding back Waiting to see, waiting to see where the where the develop what is because the issues that the region is facing are actually not very different, but they are different to the to the, to the issues that uh, that Europe and the, and the developed world's facing, and then to respond with what the, 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 I agree with the gentleman's class with the right regulation, and I think it needs to be proportionate. Good, uh, John, and then we'll go to Sharif. Yeah, just a uh, quick comment around the voice that the region might want to have in these discussions, and I agree it should have an expanded voice in, in this round of discussion around global regulation. I think to date we've been uh, talking about um, that voice as being shaping regulation, which then might eventually be adapted or adopted to the region. But I think there's an, another reason that the region should want to have a voice, which is the general economic interdependence between the region and uh, the rest of the world in that it's in, I think it's in the region's interest to get good, you know, uh, robust regulation in the U.S. and in Europe as well, given the amount of investment that's that's there. So I think that for, uh, uh, for a separate reason, uh, I think there should be a strong voice. 
I mean, I, I admire the optimism of the gentleman from Qatar, but, but I, I assure you, unfortunately, that our contribution to the new financial system, if you can call it that, will be very minimal. Um, you say that for which reason? But out, of, out, 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 out of our experience, unfortunately. I mean, our contrib contribution generally in, in the international arena, especially in the regulatory field, is, is, is minimal, uh, John. Uh, at the moment, uh, I mean, talking to regulators uh, uh, here at the WEF, uh, uh, really the, there is a feeling uh, that what happened in the world does not concern us and we do not need to uh, review our regulatory regime. I may disagree with what Professor Quraysh has said, that you are uh, concerned about over-regulation in the, in the area. I'm concerned about under-regulation, actually. Maybe this three year in government I've spent has switched me to the other side. But I would like to see not more regulations, but clever regulation, a review of the, regu of the regulatory regime throughout the region, actually. Uh, in Jordan, for example, I'll give an example. We have about four or five regulatory bodies, from the Insurance Commission to the Central Bank of Jordan to the Companies Controller uh, to the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission and others. And there's a lot of overlap and, and sometimes silly regulations which are imposed by some of them which contradict others. So I think we need to address that. I'm, I'm sure maybe similar yeah. problems are faced by countries elsewhere. So there is the cross-functional regulatory regime which has to be yeah. uh, looked at. Um, and, 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 and plus the, uh, the, uh, the, the sectoral uh, regulatory regime as well. Could be poor, pass it to Professor Qureshi. I remember covering the final Uruguay round, which led to the creation of the, the WTO, and all the deals were done between the European Union, the United States, and Japan. They would sit down and say, basically, here's the deal and the rest I mean, of the countries uh, would take it. Uh, 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 I think actually, that's changed quite a bit. Actually, actually, I was referring to my experience in the World Trade Organization. Of, uh, uh, I've negotiated and it's for still two imposed, years do you think? with 150 countries. I think Saudi Arabia was the uh, member 150 which joined. The contribution of the Arab world to the, to the negotiations, to the Green Room negotiations, and I've seen you there, John, is, is negligible. Other than Egypt, other than Egypt, I hope, I, I wish to, Rashid Rashid was there. And again, he's always uh, barely invited to the important meetings. We, we were not present. So I mean, judging from that experience, maybe, I'm saying our contribution to the new financial order or to the regulatory regime, the new regulatory regime, will be minimal. Let's be, let's be honest about it. Uh, maybe going forward 10 years from now, uh, 20 years from now, we would have ac acquired the uh, expertise and the skills which the gentleman from Qatar aspires to, and I admire his optimism. And this is the way we should think, actually. I'm not trying to be negative. Please uh, don't think I'm trying to be negative. No, no, no. I, the but I'm, well I'm taken. just being realistic. Good, Professor. And then we'll go to, if we can get an, another microphone here as well. To, two points. Firstly, uh, I, I'm not counseling against regulation. I'm counseling in favor of smart, dynamic yes, regulation. Absolutely. We're, because we neither have smart regulation in the UK, nor dynamic regulation. I gave you a, a case study which is a case study from our biggest bank collapse. Um, first time in more than a century, we had people queuing up to take their money out of a bank, and it was a fiasco. But the point that you make, I think, is a very important point in terms of uh, transfer of know-how. And I'm perhaps much more optimistic about the, uh, for want of a better word, the young generation, unfortunately, now that I've acquired gray hairs, that perhaps I've disqualified myself from being a member of the young generation. We see a very dynamic group which has enormous amount of optimism and is actually grasping quite energetically to gather information, gather know-how, and we are seeing fundamental changes in attitude. Towards the end of last year, if you recall, uh, we had a, a round of visits from world leaders from the economies that were most affected by the economic crisis, and giving these leaders a seat at the table uh, to participate in talks, perhaps part of it was designed to excite their interest and attract significant amounts of capital injection. It didn't work. They're becoming much more measured in their responses, and that perhaps is an indication of how they see their jurisdictions developing. And the point that you made about the QFC is a very important point. There's a strong policy of Qatarization in, in Qatar. They have Education City there, world-class uh, education institutions, same in Abu Dhabi, same in Dubai. So we're not talking about an unrealistic time frame, 10 years. It's 20 years since we had the last financial collapse, which is when I started my career. 20 years from now, we'll probably have the next financial collapse. Sure. But in between, we'll have much more sophisticated bankers and financiers in, in the whole of this region. Doesn't it give a very good argument, though, to uh, take the architecture of GAFTA, which took a long time to build, 
uh, and I brought this point up in the morning plan. 50 years to build. Uh, exactly, but we have the framework of it. But to be candid, it's it's a fairly you know naked beast. There's not a lot of teeth in this thing yet. It, it could have a lot more in there to foster a lot more cross-border trade and therefore a better architecture for regulation. Uh, shouldn't we accelerate it now that we've seen what's happened today? So the, the voice at the table is a much more cohesive voice and a much more dynamic market. And it, I don't see that taking place at this juncture. Does anybody else want to tackle that? I mean, you've been involved in the trade uh, initiatives. Everybody's kind of, uh, slowly but surely, they'll probably build up the GAFTA, unless I've misunderstood it, but I don't think so. The, the, actually, uh, as a matter of fact, the GAFTA is working very well. Uh, today, a figure was mentioned that 7% of the, uh, of the trade between the Arab, I mean, 7% uh, of the total trade in the area is uh, intra-regional. Uh, that figure actually goes up to 22% if you exclude oil. So there, there is, the trade between the area is increasing. Jordan, 40% of our exports are destined to the Arab countries, to the GAFTA countries, and 40% of, uh, roughly 40% of our imports come from the GAFTA countries. So there is more trade in the area. However, we have not yet agreed after 50 years of negotiations. We have not yet agreed on, on basic things like the rules of origin, for example, mm. which are very important for uh, trade uh, in, in goods. So there are gaps, but uh, I mean, I don't want to be the, the pessimist in this group. Uh, we, ha we have to keep at it. Uh, things are improving, and uh, we have to, uh, this is uh, the way the world is going, and we have to go in that direction. Good. We had a question from the, the lady here. Uh, yes, uh, if I look back at this old finance, oh, I'm sorry, I'm Rima from the Lebanese American University that's in Lebanon. And um, the way that I, I look at all these things in retrospect and the financial turmoil, uh, definitely the financial institutions were responsible or are responsible for the mess that we are in, but the blame is on the regulators, not financial institutions. So, and I'm going just to cite the example of the systemic risk issues where uh, we have now to deal with such a, a systemic crisis where uh, all the institutions were kind of hedging their, their risk, but they were all doing it in the same way, so we forgot the basics about correlation, and if everybody is doing it in, in the same direction, so eventually the system is going to collapse one, one day or the other. Plus, regulators have had a lot of, to play in, in creating the systemic risk fear uh, that has started back in, in with the failure of continental Illinois in the 80s, and with the failure of long-term capital management, where there is this fear that the collapse of one institution is going to lead to the collapse of the entire financial systems and even and after the fact examination of these institutions has proved that there was no such uh, real threat after all after examining these cases and I have to agree with the gentleman Sharif over here uh, regarding what we have to say in the region regarding rethinking the whole overall financial architecture uh, because what we have seen in in the western part of the world is a kind of risk shifting mechanism where every institution was trying to shift its tricks and mm. put it on somebody else. But if everybody's doing the same direction, so eventually this is what, what we get at. Well, what we have uh, proved and we have shown in the region is there is uh, a, a new type of way of conducting financial services, not by shifting risk, but by sharing risk. So when we speak about risk sharing versus risk shifting, now we can think about uh, a new type of uh, way of conducting financial services, not by imposing more regulation, whether it could be positive, like what's, what was in the Turner Review, uh, creating capital uh, in good times that can be drawn upon in bad times, and other probably good ideas, but we've had a massive failure of regulation, and more regulation is not going to solve our, our, our woes. What we need is to rethink about the way that we conduct business, and with Islamic finance, we have shown that a risk sharing mechanism is more and much more effective than a risk shifting mechanism. Hmm. Thanks. That's true. Anybody, you want to jump in on it, Nasser, though, or not? No, I, I, I'm it's quite an interesting a, concept because the, the, even the, the credit rating agencies were kind of buying into this in the United States to spread the risk. Uh, uh, and it was really came back to backfire in a big, big way in the packaging of certain products as well. I agree. Uh, there's there is a certain wisdom to saying that we should be sharing risk, and as a principle, the risk sharing would 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 minimize um, some of the at least some of the contributing factors to this crisis uh, that have occurred. Um, but having said that, of course, then this is still a young system um, in terms of Sharia compliant or Islamic financial system, and will have to be tested out in all its um, flavors and and and, and situations. Good. 
Uh, we brought up a couple of different issues that we, I think we should go back to. Uh, the level of transparency in different markets in this region, uh, corporate transparency in terms of the way we report uh, quarterly reports, uh, the way our board communicates with its shareholders, uh, the way the, the board communicates with regulators. How far along in the process would you say we are at this juncture in terms of maturity of best practices? Uh, because, it, it, for example, in, in the United States, that's a pretty good process. Uh, in the UK, the reporting is a pretty good process. It was more the products that got us into trouble as opposed to that regulatory structure. Does anybody want to jump into that? I mean, uh, judging by what happened in the past year, I think we're doing very well, uh, as, as opposed to the US or Europe. Uh, uh, but I, this is the risk again. I mean, the, the tendency of regulators here is to say, look, we, we, we uh, did not hit us, we are immune, and mm -hmm. therefore we are fine. You don't need to touch us. But on, the, on the corporate governance, actually, we do lag behind, unfortunately. Uh, a lot needs to be done. A lot has been done in the past 10 years, we have to admit, in, 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 in all countries across the region. But we were still lagging behind, a lot needs to be done, and the corporate governance principles have to be uh, trans uh, transformed into practices as well, not just having principles. Uh, in, 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 in Jordan, again, we have uh, multiple corporate governance handbooks and guidelines issued by the various regulatory regimes. There is a conflict between them. There is a lack of understanding, actually. Directors and management uh, don't really understand the, the, the principles of these uh, uh, corporate governance issues. So we need more education, more enforcement, and definitely, uh, I, would, I would argue, uh, better coordination between the various regulatory bodies, whether inside the country or across the region, in, in, in standardizing these uh, principles. John? Well, I was just going to go back to your initial comment on that the corporate governance standards in uh, the U.S. and the U.K. were, were good. And I think that there's there are certain principles that were outlined that were good, but I don't think the implementation was effective in part because uh, the expertise wasn't there on the boards to f perform, say, the risk oversight role that they needed to perform. And it wasn't always entirely clear what the separation of authority between, say, risk management and risk oversight was. So although one can talk about having in independent directors and, and talk about various corporate governance principles, having a chief risk officer, all these sorts of things that were in place, they uh, didn't necessarily manifest them that, that, that those corporate governance systems failed, uh, but not necessarily because those principles were wrong, but because the, of inadequate attention to the uh, building the right skills and expertise, putting the right people into the structure that was going, kind of being outlined as opposed to just developing the right structure. Good. Go ahead, Simon. Um, as I said earlier, I don't, don't think the issue uh, is a dearth of, of regulation uh, in the region for, for corporate governance at all. We, <clears throat> I carried out a, a corporate governance review um, for about six weeks ago, a, a, a regional review, and actually the standards are pretty high. They're not a million miles away from, from the develop, developed countries. And there's an import, importation of principles um, from developed countries which are very readily understandable, readily usable. The, the issue is um, the compliance culture, or should I say yeah. the, the lack of it. And it's not just at the, uh, the, the listed company level, it's at the uh, at private company level. It's government, it's non-government owned uh, companies. You have the the the, the situate the, the, the there's, there's a cultural tendency to keep things very private in the region, yeah. and the the uh, the region has really wrestled with the movement from private to public mm. companies. A number of companies we've taken uh, public, for example, in in, in Saudi Arabia, um, have really really struggled with the concept of of uh, corporate governance in a listed company market to the extent that we've had discussions with a, with a couple of those companies where well, they now want to delist because they just can't cope with, with, with the, what they see as the extra burden of, of corporate governance. And, and that's also happening closer to home in, in, the, in the UAE as well. Now, I think one, one of the reasons for this is because um, um, when we go and speak to, to clients, Everyone, without exception, recognises that the, 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 the standards of corporate governance have to rise, but they don't understand what the benefits are. You, we talk about the, the uh, there was a report from McKinsey, I think, in, uh, a couple of years ago, saying that um, international investors are prepared to pay 30% more for shares in listed companies 
if the corporate co governance standards meet a certain threshold. Mm. HSBC last year said that yeah. it, you know, the uh, international investors found the level of, of corporate governance in the region woeful and they were advising clients in, um, uh, in stock uh, uh, um, Transactions, yeah. to, to basically avoid because corporate governance standards hadn't been, uh, been met cost of borrowing goes down. It's just those simple facilities. People need to understand what the, what the benefits are, and I don't believe that the region does yet. Hmm. Which, John, can I, sorry, sure. can I add, the vast majority of companies in the region remain either family-owned or family-controlled. took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say. sorry. No, 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 good. And therefore, I wanted to bring I mean, the it's point. Not, it's not easy within mm -hmm. families to, to, to mm -hmm. enforce and apply corporate governance. Yeah, how do we get past that? The separation that, uh, between management and uh, ownership. And all this. But for the region to evolve. Uh, but but the, this is, this is a, a very important point. I agree 100% that yeah. you have to treat the family, off, family companies a bit differently when you, the, as compared to a typical corporate that's publicly listed and will have. Um, and there is uh, a, a expertise has already been built around uh, what's called family governance uh, structures. Yes. Uh, so family governance principles and how you treat um, succession planning, how you treat um, a, a, a participation through immediate and maybe not immediate family members in the business and so on. So there is actually a profession that's uh, centered around the specific issue of family governance that would uh, be of tremendous benefit for regional uh, families to take on board. And part of the work that we do through the uh, Halcom uh, Institute for Corporate Governance is to address this issue uh, as well. Uh, so yes, there's a transition period, the transition process that the, these entities in the region have to go through and has to be tailored to their environment, to their particular structures being family offices. By the way, I have to add the Halcom Institute has done a tremendous job. Yeah. What is the Halcom? I'm not familiar with it. Uh, the Halkama um, is a, a corporate governance institute that we established mm. about uh, two or three years ago uh, that basically um, uh, roams the region trying to improve the corporate governance standards of various uh, jurisdictions as well as corporate governance within specific entities uh, in the region. Um, we issue a report in conjunction with the IIF as well as with some regional firms uh, covering uh, or scoring corporate governance standards of regional countries, for example, in the GCC, and compare them against each other, which is kind of... Um, faux pas, you don't, you don't air your, your neighbor's dirty laundry, but um, uh, uh, we do it to inspire change, and it's worked in, in, in yeah. several hmm. jurisdictions. Uh, part of it is, yes, yes. but part of, it, part of it is also um, 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 limited to uh, members of Haukama. Good. The, the, the part so that is good for Dubai is published. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point that Simon made, namely trying to uh, help corporate entities understand why uh, corporate governance is in their interest. There was a rather illuminating statistic that was shared with us at the lunch, the Young Arab Leaders Forum. The only state that scores above 50% in a World Bank survey is Bahrain, which gets 52%. Yes. Uh, that's not particularly uh, um, positive. But the, the main region, uh, reason is not only just family control, but autocratic behavior. A lack of understanding that certain basic skill sets are required if you're going to engage in business. Fundamentals as well as knowing your business, knowing your environment, allowing other people to participate in decision making, having access to professionals, whether it's lawyers or accountants, not necessarily believing that a tame banker is in your best interests. And perhaps just as importantly, because this is something we've been seeing uh, somewhat regularly in recent months, an ability to identify and deal with Failures, systemic failures. Mm. There are some corporations that we've had to advise where they're extremely reluctant to actually deal with a failure that could not only impact on the, the, the company's well-being, but also trigger liability on the part of senior executives uh, towards shareholders. The idea that they have to accept this, reveal it, and deal with it is not necessarily uh, something that resonates with domestic culture, namely being seen to have lost face to being seen to have mm. made a mistake. That's something that the region has to grapple with. They're doing this in Dubai, I have to say, and the Sheikh Mohammed, uh, his um, message to those who've been engaging in corrupt behavior in the property uh, sphere is a very important message. And from my standpoint as a lawyer, it would be useful to see a few scalps posted up high for people to know Name and Metaphorically, shame. absolutely. Name and that shame. If you do behave in this way, this is what's going to happen to you. As opposed to, if you do behave in this way, it's not in our interest for people to know. So we 
brush it under the carpet, which is generally what seems to be happening. Yeah. In fact, uh, the, the creation of the, the, uh, the Gulf Central Bank, there was a discussion of where it was going to be based, and it, it, a lot seems to happen even with the GCC, and I don't mean this uh, in a negative way to Saudi Arabia, because of the size of the country, the size of its uh, reserves and the, and, and the cash that's on the table. And I understand from different bankers I've spoken to, there was a very healthy debate behind the scenes and meetings with King Abdullah uh, of Saudi Arabia to say, well, we should think about putting it in the UAE, or we should think about putting it in a neutral zone of Bahrain. And would you consider a central banker that's not from Saudi Arabia? And it's like, oh. Well, no, actually we're not considering that, and we don't want to go there. And the discussion was over. So how can you actually get to a pan-regional development if, it, you know, again, the big brother of the region is going to say, no, it's going to be dominated here. And I say it to you and look at you because I think it's a good, healthy debate of how does Dubai build that sort of weight if you have that, you know, the big elephant as an economy calling most of the shots of these days, even within the G20 on behalf of the UAE. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt that, that Saudi Arabia is uh, the market of the region uh, in terms of population, in terms, in terms of spending power and so on. But to move beyond um, uh, what we traditionally, historically did with respect to the world economy, we will need to take an inclusive view. Uh, and that's our firm belief as, as Dubai and as, as the UAE. Uh, so the, these multilateral institutions that we're building need to be uh, appropriately, appropriately represented across the region and right now uh, and, and, and distributed across the region uh, as well so that all can, can benefit. But I don't necessarily believe that going to the extreme that Europe has gone to, uh, such as for example holding meetings or shifting headquarters um, of entire multilateral institutions within Europe from one city to the other with all the filing cabinets and desks from Strasbourg to Luxembourg idea. to Brussels. I don't want to mention it directly, but... Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's phenomenal. It's, it still exists today. Dubai will have to learn to make compromises, John, at one point. So, <laughs> with uh, Saudi Arabia, it's okay. <laughs> so, you know, we believe that um, fundamentally, actually, the case for the UAE is quite strong. Um, the UAE is the uh, commercial hub of the region. And there's no doubt about that in terms of the, 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 the strength of, of Dubai and the, the commercial prowess of, of, of Dubai. Um, and add to that that the UAE does not today have any multilateral institution uh, that is GCC multilateral institution based in it. It uh, makes for a good, good argument. Good. Yeah. Thank you for taking the question too. I'm Christy Lee from Ori Investment. Um, just a quick comment about the G20. Um, actually just before coming here I started an informal uh, forum between the Korean government and the market participants um, because Korea will be the chair uh, next year for the G20. So uh, I'm trying to play a role between the market uh, participants and the government so the market participants could understand what's taking place um, in the G20 forum and how this G20 is going to influence the new architecture in the financial sector and also try to bring in some um, inputs from the market into the G20. And Saudi Arabia will be the chair of of G20 in uh, 2011. So Korean government and Saudi Arabia will be collaborating closely um, from next year. So um, in terms of the point about better coordination is needed um, in the region um, before Saudi Arabia represents uh, the region in the G20. And I think uh, it's a perfect time to start um, this coordination and discussion um, when Korea is taking over the chair, chair of G20 this November and when Korea is working closely with Saudi Arabia, uh, which is the incoming chair. So I think, you know, I really strongly encourage the leaders from this region to, you know, put to act together um, so that better coordination and uh, better representation is made in the G20. Good. Is the G20 going to be the, the uh, structure of du jour uh, going forward? Will it last past this uh, crisis because they were scrambling to see, and I know because I talked to a lot of the finance ministers that there was a huge debate between a G12, G14, G15, and then they thought, well, we do have this existing structure of the G20, so why not? Does it, uh, does it grow up, develop, does it have teeth? Uh, will it be the, the framework in which we can build the 21st century economy? Anybody have any strong thoughts about it? From, a, from the Global Redesign Initiative, does it, does it survive, John? 
I think it has to evolve would be uh, my view that it, it has to reflect the changing weight in the global economy of uh, that's outside the OECD your traditional uh, you know G14 if, if you will uh, and whether that means you just add more or just change the way the G20 works or create an entirely new institution I think there's different ways that that could go but I, I, I guess my general sense would be it'd probably be better to stretch and evolve the existing institution than to throw it out but it does have to then reflect the weight uh, or run the risk that actually you'll you'll split the uh, world into regional blocks and I think that was the uh, one of the scenarios that was in the new financial architecture project that uh, we did with the WEF uh, earlier this year uh, was around there's sort of four scenarios painted I won't go through them all but in one of the scenarios uh, there was uh, there wasn't the successful creation of international institutions that could mm. successfully govern across the globe so you started to get regional trade blocks that started to develop uh, governance for their themselves and then those blocks were, were distinct and started to separate in terms of trade mm. and capital and investment and so forth that's a different world I don't think it's a better world but that's a world that could evolve if the G20 can evolve. Good, sure. John, I think as, as the gentleman uh, he left uh, said earlier, it's a reali realization by the uh, G8 and the, and the big economies that global crisis requires global solutions and they cannot do it on their own really. I think we're dealing with uh, problems of the 21st centuries and the uh, institutions of the 20th century are not set up to deal with these problems. So we have to be more inclusive. I would not be surprised if, if a new group comes up, uh, G30 maybe, or G40, or we have the group of 77 and China. Mm. This may be involved at, at, at one point. Uh, really, it is a global crisis. And uh, it, if it taught us anything, it, it does teach us that problems in one part of the world, uh, the, the, the effect of these problems and the effect of these um, issues are felt everywhere, really. So uh, it is, it, it is in, the, in the best interests of everyone to be more inclusive. Good. Any other inputs from the floor? We've had a lot of uh, participation. If there is, uh, you know, terrific. Uh, if not, I think we've actually dug into this subject much further than I thought we were going to. Uh, but I'm going to take the liberty to, to wrap it up. And I want to thank all the people in the audience for uh, the questions and everybody stretching a little bit uh, to cover the geopolitical issues that are part of the debate as well, from the WTO to the G8 uh, to the G20. So thanks very much. And we'll see everybody uh, in the next uh, the evening uh, receptions and, and also tomorrow. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.